Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Maria. I'm a parishioner here. For those of you who don't know me at St. Helen, uh, we just want to welcome you to our parish, those of you who are parishioners, and also those of you who are from other parishes um, in our in our diocese or maybe not in our diocese. We have a lot of people from um, a lot of different places. So thank you for joining us this morning. A few little housekeeping things before we start. Uh, there's a few of us in our cynical, our divine will cynical that have name tags. And so if you have any questions or need any assistance, you can ask any one of us. We're more than happy to help. Our restrooms are located down this hallway um, as you exit the church to the right and then another right. Uh, we also have another set of restrooms downstairs and there is a stairwell uh, to the right in the back of the gathering space. And for those of you who need an elevator, there's an elevator right past uh, where they're selling the books in the hallway here. Uh, we are selling some books. Uh, Daniel brought his book and we also have uh, another book, we also have a resource sheet uh, of websites and different books that you can uh, go online, look at, uh, purchase. So you can visit that table at any point to purchase something or just uh, grab a resource sheet. Actually, the resource sheet is on the, next to the free will offering in the gathering space. And there's a, a few prayer cards there. Uh, today is free for you, but if you are so inclined to uh, donate toward today. You are more than welcome to do that uh, in that free will basket that's up here. We also will have one downstairs uh, when we break for lunch. If you are not a parishioner and you would like information emailed to you, we are having a few more talks. Uh, Daniel won't unfortunately be with us for all of those. But uh, if you're interested, we are hosting our next one is December 4th in the evening. And you are welcome to attend that. Uh, if you would leave your name and your email, there's a sheet on the resource on the book table where you can leave your email and name with us, and we'll make sure we just let you know the information as December 4th comes closer. And for those of you who belong to our parish, you will absolutely hear about that uh, here as well. So a little bit about today. Uh, Daniel's going to give two talks, and so uh, the, and in between those two talks, you'll have a short break to um, you know, go to the restroom if you need to or stretch your legs. Then he'll begin his second talk at around 12 o'clock. For those of you who have registered for our lunch, you are welcome to join us downstairs in our parish hall, and we, I will talk a little bit more about that before we head down there. Uh, and then after lunch, if you would like to stay, uh, Daniel is going to do a Q&A back up here in the church. So that's kind of how the day is going to go. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our pastor, Father Jay. Good morning, everyone. As Maria said, my name is Father Jay McPhillips. I'm the pastor here at St. Helens, and I want to welcome all of you to our parish family home. I do want to, before you get started, one little house, you know, we, house detail. We have, um, there's a lot of anxiety that people have today with COVID and everything else. We do have in our church and in our hall downstairs, we have a UV filtering system. So just to, if, if you're very nervous about that, just to maybe put your mind at ease, that you are, we are, you are being protected. So uh, why don't we just start with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, your son Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as you know for us, those words are much easier said than done. We just pray that you shower your grace upon us so that each and every one of us might truly embrace your will. That each and every one of us might truly seek to do your will in our daily lives and to give you glory as we obey you and as we seek to make your will our will. We thank you today for the gift of Daniel O'Connor. We thank you for his uh, the blessing of having him here at St. Helens. We pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to anoint his lips so that he might speak in your name and that he can touch all of our hearts. 
that he can inspire us by his words to truly embrace your will, to truly love your will, to truly seek to do your will all the days of our lives. We pray that you bless all of us present here. We pray for um, you bless our parish and you bless all the parishes that are represented here. And we pray, Lord, that each and every one of us might seek to do your will now and always. And we pray this and we pray all things through Jesus Christ, your Son, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you, God Almighty Father, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So um, Daniel O'Connor, uh, I had the privilege of having breakfast with him this morning. He was telling me he's been involved with the divine will for about a dozen years. He came across somebody and it's become very much a passion in his life. He's an engineer, mechanical engineer, um, and after becoming an engineer, he went to the seminary for a while, and he, um, after about six months in the seminary, he figured priesthood wasn't for him, but he stayed at the seminary and got his master's in theology. So uh, he's a, a very accomplished young man. He's a professor of philosophy, and, um, and of course, his passion is helping people understand the divine will so they can better live the divine will. So we're really blessed to have him with today. And so without any further ado, Daniel O'Connor. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Hope you guys are ready to learn. <laughs> I just have to figure out what punishment to use for those who don't pay attention, since I can't, I can't flunk you. So I don't know, we'll, we'll have to get creative. I know, thank you for that beautiful prayer, Father, and please, all of you, do pray that the Holy Spirit is sent upon me so that I may speak all of God's words and only God's words, and maybe we can just together say one more quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Heaven, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Faustina, pray for us. Saint Hannibal di Francia, pray for us. Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So thank you so much for having me here. It's truly an honor. I'm very happy to be with people physically for so long now. I've only been uh, sitting behind a desk speaking to a camera. And with, since the start of the pandemic, I've probably only traveled to speak, I think, once other than this. So um, you know, I'm very proud of myself for remembering to uh, put pants on. But, <laughs> but I didn't even have to, did I? Like, <laughs> I could have. Pajamas and, and uh, slippers would have been just fine, I guess, here. But let me just quickly put this down. I'll get to that later. Um, so I'm here to speak about the gift of living in the divine will and the revelations of, the ser of Jesus to the servant of God, Luis Picaretta. And that probably sounds a little out there to some people. A lot, I'm sure many of you haven't even heard of that. So I want to begin, I want to, in our first talk here, introduce that concept itself. Um, and just to reiterate, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody running the show here, but it's, it's talk, break, second talk, and then noon is when we're done with that, right? And then we go down for lunch at noon. Okay, so I won't be talking at noon, but then after lunch we'll be, I think, coming back up here and I can take as many questions as you guys may have. I can stick around for as long as you'd like, because I have uh, there, my gratitude to those hosting. I'm staying at the cabins in the park nearby. It's just beautiful there. And we're staying there tonight as well. Okay, and by we, I mean my family and I, so I drove down here with, with my wife and four kids, so um, I'm not sure if that got me a lot of extra purgatory time or got me out of <laughs> purgatory time, but it just it wasn't always pretty, I'll say that much. Anyway, um, the, so we're introducing this thing that's kind of new for some people, I'm sure, for most of us, many of us, and as Catholic Christians, Whenever anything new is introduced to us, the first thing we have to do is make sure that it fits perfectly, beautifully, harmoniously with the faith itself as expressed in public revelation and in sacred tradition. Those are what Vatican II, I believe, calls the two wellsprings of the Word of God, both in Scripture itself and in sacred tradition. So 
if anyone presents something to you, some new spiritual thing, and it's not solidly grounded and harmonious with both of those two, we shouldn't have anything to do with it as Catholic Christians. So let's get as central, as foundational as possible with our faith. Let's back up to the single thing, perhaps more than anything else, you could say is the pillar, the foundation, the central dimension of Christianity itself. And I want you to think for a moment about what that might be as I give some hints as to what I'm gonna present to you that it is. It's directly from Jesus, it's in the Gospels, it's in the Didache, which is a document that called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, so as the name implies, written by the apostles themselves, close to, close to scripture in importance, the Didache. It's in every mass that's been said for 2,000 years. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian in history, he calls it the most perfect of prayers. The Catechism calls it the fundamental Christian prayer and the quintessential prayer of the Church. The Church Father Tertullian calls it a summary of the whole gospel. Any guesses as to what I'm talking about here? The Our Father, yep. The Lord's Prayer, the climax of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the greatest prayer. Nothing could be more essential to our faith and our sacred tradition as Catholic Christians than the Our Father. Nothing could be more traditional, nothing could be more Catholic than diving as deeply as we can into the essence of the Our Father. So the Our Father, every single word of it's superlatively important, but even the Our Father has an essence. And if we want to fulfill our calling as Christians the best possible way, I think that one of the most powerful things we can do, if not the most powerful thing we can do, is to dive into that essence of the Lord's Prayer. But let's see what the Catechism says here. Since our prayer sets forth our desires before God, it is again the Father, he who searches the hearts of men who knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The prayer to our Father, there's, it's talking about the Our Father here, is inserted into the mysterious mission of the Son and the Spirit. In the Eucharistic liturgy, the Mass, the Lord's Prayer appears as the prayer of the whole Church, and there it reveals the full its full meaning and efficacy, that is, its power. Placed between the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, and the communion, when we receive communion, the Lord's Prayer sums up, on the one hand, all the petitions and intercessions expressed in the movement of the epiclesis, the movement of the Spirit, and, on the other hand, it knocks at the door of the banquet of the kingdom of heaven, which sacramental communion anticipates. All right, those are the lofty words that the Catechism uses to teach about the nature of the Our Father. And what's in that? In that paragraph are three keys that we should remember. The Our Father is not just a prayer that we say and then forget, it's actually the model of our own desire. The our Father should be the model of our own desires, the Catechism's teaching that. Two, that it's part of the mysterious mission of the Trinity itself. And three, that it's the ultimate link between heaven and earth. That's what, the, that's what the catechism is saying there in so many words. And the first teaching, that we should inflame our desires according to the Our Father, St. Augustine relayed that beautifully. He said, run through all the words of the holy prayers in scripture, and I do not think that you will find anything in them that is not contained and included in the Lord's Prayer. So by using the Lord's Prayer as the model for our whole life, we're not neglecting anything else. And we have to always make sure we never neglect anything in the faith. But uh, the Our Father is, we're certainly at no risk of doing that by choosing the Our Father as the model of our life. Everything's in it. That's what we wanna do if we wanna be the best Christians, the best Catholics possible. Model, model our lives in accordance with it. But the Catechism is also saying, with its second and third teachings we just noted, that the Our Father is much more. It's much more than it might appear at first glance. It's the Trinity's, it's, it's, it describes the Trinity's mysterious mission and it's the link between heaven and earth. So if we really want to dive into the Our Father more than we have before, we have to understand something about this mysterious mission of the Holy Trinity. And this mysterious mission of the Holy Trinity is 
for us, our participation in that mission, I should say, is about sitting around and eating cookies waiting for the end of the world, right? That's, that's, is that all we're doing when we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Just, as, just asking for the world to end and waiting around for that to happen? No, of course not. Of course not. Some people, unfortunately, that's the sense they get, that when we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're just praying for the end of time. And of course, there's the final coming of Christ in the flesh. Of course, we anticipate that, look forward to it, pray for it. But that's not all we're doing when we're, when we're praying for the accomplishment of God's will on earth as in heaven. That would make the petition almost pointless, wouldn't it? If there wasn't something on earth that needs to happen as well to better mimic, to better correspond to heaven. I want to read a quote here uh, from a church historian, Professor Jacques Cabal, the Catholic scholar here. He starts this quote with a little bit of sarcasm that I have to read. He says, when we recite the Our Father, we petition God for the abolition of life on earth. What a paradox. We know no better way of honoring the creator than to aspire for the extinction of our species. All right. So he, he's, he couldn't help with the sarcasm. Now he gets a little more serious, and he says, most of us would find such an interpretation aberrant. I suspect that many people, nonetheless, when they recite the Lord's Prayer, they have the impression that they're only praying for their coming to a heaven hereafter. Do they realize, however, that this would imply the concomitant destruction of our world? Are the theologians who deny the possibility of an establishment of the kingdom of God on earth aware that they are thereby excluding the literal interpretation of the two fundamental demands of the Our Father? Is there anyone in his right mind who would say, please, Lord, we beg of you, destroy this world, which is unworthy of your divine concern? Nobody would be caught expressing himself in this fashion. The Our Father is rather in its first half an eschatological prayer, and we should read it in precisely those terms. The coming of the kingdom that it evokes is good news, not only for hereafter, he's saying not only for heaven, that's of course the supreme end, but it's not only about that. He says, the kingdom will come at the right moment. You should petition for its coming with faith, perseverance, and a joyful heart. Almighty God, may thy kingdom come. May thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This kingdom is the purpose of creation. It should have happened earlier. Original sin delayed its coming, but did not preclude it forever. You know, everything that I'm trying to say, that he's trying to say, and that maybe it's safe to say, that everything Jesus is trying to tell the servant of God, Louis Spicaretta, is that those words mean what they say. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That you don't have to feel ashamed praying those words with full faith, full confidence that they really mean what they say. All right. So the Our Father is the blueprint of history as well. If all of Christianity can be seen in the Our Father, then all of history can also be seen in it. We know if we want to look at the overarching plan of history, we have to look at its beginning. We know how it began. The, the Garden of Eden, everything perfect. God's will was done on earth as in heaven, in the garden. Adam went ahead and ruined that for us. But we don't stress about that fact. We don't, we we're not angry at Adam. Why? What, what do we pray in the exultet at Easter? Oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin, which, which, um, shoot, <laughs> which, got, which got for us so great a redeemer. It's not, the got isn't the word, but it's something like that. We, we, we ironically almost praise God for this sin of Adam because because of it, Jesus came into the world and he's, he's fixed everything. He's begun the fixing of all things with his sacrifice on the cross. That's the climax of the story of history. But it hasn't all been fulfilled yet, of course. There's still much work to be done. And it's going because of, because of Adam's sin. What, how Jesus is going to fix everything, how he's going to set everything right is going to be better than it ever would have been if Adam never sinned. That's how God always fixes things. He doesn't just try and make it back like it was. He always makes it even better. In fact, that's something we can philosophically know about the nature of God, that he only even allows any evil to occur if he knows, not just that he's going to fix it, but that he's going to bring an even greater good out of it. We can be certain of that, that every Every evil, every pain, every suffering, every unfortunate thing of any sort is always and only a precursor, always a precursor to God doing something even better that wouldn't have been possible 
in any other way. Now, if that's possible, if that's the case always with God, and it is, then it's certainly the case with the fall of man itself. God is going to fix that. His will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus prayed it, he prophesied it, it's a guarantee. All right, before the world ends, therefore, it will return. St. Thomas Aquinas, gotta quote him again, he says, all things find their perfection in returning to their origin. All things find their perfection in returning to their origin. So that's, um, and remember, he's this great theologian saint who lived many hundreds of years ago. He's got nothing to do with, specifically with Luis Picaretta, but his teachings are very powerful here. He's, so if we think about this process, the, like a, a, what does every plant start with? A seed, go from seed to the, the first sprouts, the seedling, the, the shoot, the plant gets developed and mature, eventually it develops its fruit, and then the culmination of this plant's life is found in what's in the very core of that fruit, and it's the purpose of this whole plant's generation, well, yet another seed. So all things find their perfection in returning to their origin. That's going to be the case with history also. The world, the church, came forth from God's hands, holy, beautiful, and it must return to him before the end of time in the same manner, or rather an even more glorious manner. So we're focusing here on the central petition of the Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're only really doing that for the sake of time. I mean, every, as I said before, every single word in the Our Father is so important that you could spend your whole life to any word in it, and you'd still only scratch the surface. But the works of God, they always have hierarchy. There's always some form of hierarchy in everything God does, because hierarchy is beautiful. Uh, he doesn't, when, when God makes something, it's not like a warehouse. It's, more, it's like a cathedral. It's not like elevator music. It's like a symphony. There's all sorts of variety in what he does. So in the, Our Father itself, it also has a hierarchy notwithstanding the extreme, superlative, infinite importance of each of its petitions, but it builds, in its first half, it builds towards its climax in that petition we're talking about, which is the greatest petition of the Our Father. But how do we know that? How do we know that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the greatest? Well, it's the petition that contains all other petitions within itself. And the whole is always greater than the part. What contains something else within it cannot itself be surpassed by one of its parts. That's a philosophical first principle. I'll, I will not get too much more into that, but if God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, then everything else is taken care of, isn't it? We're, we, we will have forgiveness then. We'll have our, our deliverance from evil, our deliverance from temptation. We'll have our daily bread. God's name will be hallowed. His kingdom will have come as much as possible on earth. All of those things are accomplished within his will being done on earth as in heaven. Christianity itself, the whole faith, is actually contained within that one petition. Uh, Scott Hahn wrote, the Lord's Prayer is one unified, compact, model prayer consisting of seven petitions dividable into two parts. The first, God word. The second, us word. And he says, no poetic work of art was ever more perfectly crafted. And he's right. The Our Father is also perfect poetry. And what that, that tells us something about the nature of the petitions in it. I want to quote another biblical scholar here. He talked about the Our Father as a hymnic prose poem, which has synonymous poetic parallelism between the first half, about God's name, kingdom, and will, and the second half, about our bread, debt, and temptation. Each half is itself in crescendo, or climactic parallelism, building up through the three component challenges name and kingdom come to a climax in will. So that's about the most I've ever said about poetry in my life. I know nothing about how it works, but it sounds right to me. You know, I know nothing about music either, but I can, I can tell a harmonious note when I hear one, as we all can, versus a discordant one. And I think we can all see the poetry in the Our Father itself. You know, why wouldn't Jesus have also made it be a perfect poetic work of art, as Scott Hahn says, and he, he's, again, he's right about that. Let's, uh, let's look at some even more authoritative voices here on this petition. Servant of God, Archbishop Louis Martinez. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. He's gonna become much more famous soon. He was the spiritual director of Blessed Conchita, a mystic who was beatified, and I'm gonna share some quotes with her, from her later. An incredibly holy, amazing archbishop in Mexico from the 20th century. He taught 
and he wrote a great book called The Sanctifier on the Holy Spirit. He also taught, and this, I think this quote might actually be from The Sanctifier, Jesus laid bare the fundamental longing of his soul when he taught us to say, and he guesses, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Archbishop, the servant of God, Archbishop Martinez, he's saying that's the fundamental desire of Jesus' soul, is his teaching us to pray those words. The will of God, this is continuing from uh, the Archbishop here, the will of God is to reflect himself in creatures. The fulfillment of that will is his glory. It is the end of all his works and the end of all his creatures. Their happiness, that is, our happiness, consists in cooperating in its accomplishment. It's okay to want to be happy, that it is okay. And guess where you'll find your happiness? In the accomplishment of God's will, nowhere else, nowhere else. So it's Jesus' passion, it's what he longs for for us more than anything else, and it's the thing that will give us everything we could ever want, the will of God. St. John Chrysostom is the father of the church. He's got a beautiful teaching on this petition. He's often considered the greatest of the Eastern Fathers, so this is a very central voice in sacred tradition. He says, for God did not say, thy will be done in me or in us, he's talking about the Our Father here, but everywhere on earth, so that error may be destroyed, truth implanted, and all wickedness cast out, and virtue return, and no difference in this respect be henceforth between heaven and earth. No difference in this respect between heaven and earth. So he says, in this respect, that's very important. There's always a difference between heaven and earth. We don't get to heaven until we get to heaven. We don't get the beatific vision until we actually see God face to face in heaven and all the other things that that entails. But his will, God's will can be accomplished on earth as in heaven. And it must be. It must, we must return to that state. Jesus wouldn't have taught us to pray something impossible, would he? St. John Cashin, he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There cannot be a greater prayer than to desire that earthly things should, deserve, should equal heavenly ones. He's saying you can't even imagine a greater prayer than that. St. Alphonsus Liguori has a comment about another saint, St. Catherine of Genoa, about a private revelation to that saint. He says, the Lord recommended to St. Catherine of Genoa that every time she said the Our Father, to pay particular attention to these words. Guess which ones? Thy will be done. And to beg for the grace to fulfill the will of God as perfectly as the saints in heaven. All right, I'm gonna stop with those little quotes because I need to get further here. But um, we could go on for a long time with quotes like that, but the point is that everything is within this. Everything is within. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything is in the triumph of the divine will. If we have that, we don't have to worry about every, anything else because we have everything within that. If we have everything else but that, we've got nothing. We could compress it, though. We could compress the words, thy will be done, that supreme petition. We could compress it into um, just one word, if we wanted to also. Fiat. There's a, there's a pop quiz. How did everything, how did it all begin? Just everything. How did everything begin? The beginning. This, I think this is just a couple verses into Scripture. And God said, let there be light. And in the original Latin, I mean, not that Genesis was written in Latin, but the official Vulgate is fiat lux. The very first words God spoke ever in the history of creation record, recounted in Scripture, fiat lux, let there be light. Fiat, it's, and of course, if you pray the Our Father in Latin, you're also, you're, you're, you're reminded of this because you're praying fiat volontas tua, thy will be done. So it's not just this, this fiat, the, what's contained in the fiat is not just the essence and the primary petition of the Our Father, it's not just the, uh, the essence of Christianity itself as if that weren't enough, but it's also that which called existence into being. It's what we have to thank for our existence itself. We don't thank God for our existence often enough, do we? we? We thank him for individual blessings as we should, but you know, our first and greatest good is the fact that we exist. And nothing else, no one, we can't receive any blessings if we don't exist first. So we need to uh, be more cognizant of the grace of our existence. Mother Angelica wrote a beautiful piece on that. I 
highly recommend it. And that's all I can do is recommend it because I don't even remember what it's called. But she gave us this meditation about God hovering over all these infinite possibilities for who he could create. And the mere fact that you were called into existence, you might think you're just, I'm just one of billions of people. Do you know how many trillions, quadrillions, Google plexes of people God could have created but didn't in order to create you? It's unfathomable. Our existence is our first and greatest good, and that's thanks to the fiat. There's another really important fiat in scripture, though, isn't there? Dicit autem Maria, ecce an sila domini fiat mihi secundum verbum tu. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. The fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We've got exi our existence. We thank the fiat for our existence, but we also thank our eligibility for eternal life to another fiat, the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth has a powerful teaching on this I need to share. He says, the moment when the angel of the Lord came to Mary with the great announcement of the incarnation, she gave her reply, then transpired the greatest event in our history, the incarnation. The word became flesh. Mary placed her entire being at the disposal of God's will. The will of Mary coincides with the will of her son in the Father's unique project of love. And in Mary, heaven and earth are united. God, the creator, is united to his creature. Remember, the link between heaven and earth in the Our Father. We're seeing that physically transpiring in Mary. How? Because of her fiat, which means what? Benedict is saying. It means that the, her will coincides perfectly with the will of her son. It is, he continues on, this union of heaven and earth is the purpose of the incarnation and redemption. Christianity. It's the purpose of it. So Benedict is saying that everything can be found in that. that the, and this is, this fiat is made possible by Mary's will, the union of Mary's will with the divine will, which, to spoil the plot for you here right now, is exactly what God is calling all of us to. Now that this grace is available, a union of our wills with the divine will that's modeled after Our Lady's own union with the divine will. And we'll never be another Our Lady. We'll never match her, much less exceed her. No one ever will. That's impossible. She's, she'll always be the greatest. But the point is, we are now being called to enter into that same type of life, of union of wills that Mary always had with her son, with the will of her son, the divine will of her son. Pope Benedict taught again, to be devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary means to embrace this attitude of heart which makes fiat, your will be done, the defining center of one's whole life. The defining center of one's whole life. He's, uh, he's, and he's saying that this is what you could describe devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary as. That's just one way of looking at it. This is also just the fundamental to the faith, making the fiat the defining center of your life. So we're seeing quite a convergence here around this petition, aren't we? Around the words, thy will be done, or fiat, on earth as it is in heaven. History itself, Christianity itself, the entire calling, our, our entire life, everything, all of it's in this, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can't possibly overestimate the importance of that. But before we move on from its centrality in our faith, there's one more fiat we really have to acknowledge, isn't there? because it's not just Mary who models this for us. Her son, Jesus is God, of course, yes, but did he have a human will? Yes, he did. It can be easier to forget that. He did have a human will. He was fully God and fully man, and to be fully man, you can't be fully human unless you also have a human will. So yes, he had a human will, and he also modeled perfectly for us how to keep that will in absolute union with the divine will. The Catechism teaches that the whole prayer of Jesus is contained in a certain few words. And you can all guess what they are. Yes, it's in the central petition of the Our Father, but where else did Jesus say those exact same words? Gethsemane, yeah. Nevertheless, thy will not mine be done. The agony in the garden, when Jesus 
He had a human will, yes, but in the agony in the garden with those words, he modeled for us how to keep our will always, no matter what, no matter the cross, no matter the circumstances, to keep our will absolutely united to the divine will. It's the paradigm of his whole life. St. John, John Chrysostom, who we quoted earlier, he also says here, Jesus prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. It is clear here that his human will is in full harmony with God's will. This harmony is what we must always seek after and follow. That's the model for our lives. And everywhere we look for the supremely important, dramatic moments of, of eschatological, un unrivaled importance in public revelation, we find them all converging around the fiat. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Benedict, we have to quote Benedict one more time here. I shouldn't say one more time. We're going to get to him again. He's, uh, he's got so much wisdom to share in this. Benedict says, in Jesus' prayer, not my will, but your will be done. He recapitulates the whole process of his life. God's will is the place where we find our true identity. God created us. We are ourselves if we conform with his will. Only in this way do we enter into the truth of our being. Redemption is always this process of leading the human will to communion with the divine will. It is a process for which we pray every day, may your will be done. All right, a recapitulation is to summarize and repeat the main point of something. Benedict is teaching us that this prayer, not my will but thine be done, is the recapitulation of Jesus' whole life. All right. It's something he certainly said during his life as well, even if we failed to see that centrality in the Garden of Gethsemane, which it does have. We see it elsewhere in the Gospel also. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother, as Matthew 12, 50. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Those are just also all different quotes of Jesus in the Gospels themselves. For Jesus, the will of his Father was the foundation of his relationship with souls. In the Our Father, we find these words that seem to come forth as a triumphant cry from the depths of his soul, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wished to tell us in our own language how avidly he sought to do the Father's will and how that will was his very life, the foundation of his soul, the norm of perfection, the secret of happiness, the repose of love. That's again, that quote is again from the servant of God, Archbishop Louis Martinez. All right, so much more we could say about that. But at this point, I don't think too many people need a lot more convincing that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is everything. We've already seen that it's the object, the thing that we're considering in the greatest petition of the greatest prayer, that it's the fundamental principle of scripture, public revelation itself, that it's the life and breath of Jesus and his most holy mother. But that's all just in the foundation. So public revelation, scripture, that's the foundation of our faith. And we're seeing all of this in the foundation. So what do you do with a foundation? What's the point of a foundation? Like, do you just, does it just sit there and, and, and then you can play on it? Well, no, you have a foundation laid down to build on. And the fundamental design of the foundation, you can look at that and you can infer what the building itself, how the building itself is gonna develop. You can't infer the details, of course. You can infer the direction that it's gonna go in. The foundation is key because it's immovable. Once the foundation's down, and I'm talking analogously, of course, about putting a, building a literal structure, you don't move it, no matter what. You're stuck building the building on top of that. You don't negotiate with it. You don't mess with it. That's the analogy. That's public revelation in Scripture. After the death of the Apostle John, no new public revelation, no matter what, till the end of time. There will never be a new public revelation, a new Scripture. But that doesn't mean that what God was doing in laying down the foundation stopped when the foundation was done. It actually means the opposite. When, you, when you're fun, done with the foundation, you can really get to work building on it. You, you have the blueprint set down. You don't have to wonder anymore where the building's ultimately gonna be. You don't have to, you don't have to wonder what 
where you should be building, right there, right on that foundation. So public revelation's main thrust, would we see it just stop at the close of the age of public revelation? Of course not. We see the opposite. We see God getting to work even more zealously in revealing, not by way of inspiring more scriptures, but by speaking interiorly to the saints, revealing the full glory contained in the accomplishment of his will on earth as it is in heaven. And that is exactly what we see. That's exactly what we see in what followed public revelation in the development of sacred tradition. Remember we said, I had said earlier that we, um, we need to say no as Catholics to anything new presented to us that's not in full harmony with both scripture and sacred tradition, the two wellsprings of the word of God. So we can see that everything is the divine will in scripture, but what about after that point? The greatest works, they take time. They take a lot of, so the greater the work, the more time it takes. So I know a lot of people wonder, well, why couldn't people who have already been at least a little bit introduced to the gift of living in the divine will and all the glories that it entails might be tempted to say, why couldn't this all have come about 2,000 years ago? Why wouldn't this have just been in Scripture itself? Why wouldn't this have been a, a devotion or something right in the beginning of Christianity? Well, that would be like teaching calculus to someone just starting algebra, is the analogy I use. It takes a lot of time to prepare for the greatest works. The foundations down, the sacred traditions development for 2,000 years consist in building the walls and the floors and everything else, but what's at the very top? Well, hopefully a solid gold steeple. And that's what the gift of living in the divine will is. We're going to see that steeple, that solid gold steeple being prepared for in these 2,000 years of sacred traditions development, which I'm going to have to heavily abridge right now because I don't have long, do I? So we're at 1040. I promise I will not force anyone to wet their pants. You will be allowed to use the bathroom. Uh, but should I, should I go until 11 before we take our break? Or is that, I'll, I'll, I'll aim for that, how about that? All right. The first thing we need to remember when we're going through sacred traditions development is that the same Holy Spirit who inspired every single word of scripture, he did every word of scripture, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He didn't, his job description didn't change when the Apostle John died. It's true that there's no more sacred scripture, no more public revelation being revealed after that point, but the fundamental mission that God, the Holy Spirit, was undertaking in scripture, he continued. He continued doing for the, for the development of sacred tradition. And in fact, I would, God never changes, he's immutable, but our, under, our, our relation as changeable creatures, that can make some changes seem apparent. And I would say, if anything, he stepped it up. He stepped up the pace. Remember, public revelation itself in the New Testament, how long did that take to prepare for? That took 4,000 years. So, you know, 2,000 years might seem like a while, but it's actually a lot less than 4,000, isn't it? So he, uh, Jesus says something like that to Louisa, something to, along the lines of that the church is more powerful and pleasing to him than the Israelites of the Old Testament. So he can work more quickly now. And that's why it's only going to take 2,000 years for the, that's why it did only take 2,000 years for the preparation for the gift of living in the divine will. Anyway, let's not get to that till we get to it. This new era of, the, of, of God's work in the world, as I said, it was an acceleration, an acceleration in the fulfillment of his will because the works of God always move forward. And I've got to um, quote Benedict again here. Benedict XVI, he says, there are views that see the entire history of the church in the second millennium as a gradual decline. Some even see the decline as starting immediately after the New Testament. But in fact, opera Christi non deficiunt sed proficiunt, which means Christ's works do not go backwards, but forwards. What would the church be without the new spirituality of Cistercians, of Franciscans, Dominicans, spirituality of St. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and so forth. Benedict says, this affirmation applies today too. The works of God move forward. This doesn't mean modernism. Modernism is a heresy. Uh, what this, modernism looks to the world. It looks to the development of the world to try and ascertain what to do. That's not the proper approach here. Tradition looks at what God is doing in the saints. 
That's how we see what true progress consists. You look at what Pope St. John Paul II referred to as the lived theology of the saints. We must take as an absolute fact the reality that God is always active in the lives of the saints. If we want to see what he's trying to do in the world, we look at what he did in their lives. The Catechism says that even if revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. It remains for the Christian faith to gradually grasp the full significance over the course of centuries. So it takes, this process takes centuries. It has taken centuries to get us to the point we're at today, which is the culmination of it all. This is also in the Catechism. The Holy Spirit is at work with the Father and the Son from the beginning to the completion of the plan for our salvation. But in these end times, ushered in by the Son's redeeming incarnation, the Spirit is revealed and given, recognized, and welcomed as a person. The Holy Spirit is God. He always existed. But we didn't know he was a distinct person in God until public revelation. And our welcoming him as a person, again, steps up the degree of graces available. Now this divine plan, accomplished in Christ, the firstborn and head of the new creation, can be embodied in mankind by the outpouring of the Spirit. And there's an early uh, patristic, I mean, early church saint, St. Vincent of Lorenz. He has a good quote on this. He says, certainly there is progress in the church, even exceedingly great progress. Who would be so envious of others and so hateful towards God as to try to prohibit it? And he, he says that this is necessary gradually in the, whole court, in the whole church over the course of centuries. He says, this is a, a saint, he's saying it would be hateful of God to try to prevent the growth that he's inspiring in the church. All right, why are we seeing so much of this recently when it seems that only the opposite is happening? You know, if you look around the church and the world, it doesn't exactly look like things are getting better and better, does it? It seems to be the opposite. Well, it is the opposite, but that's, not what has the final say. Yes, the church and the world are getting more and more mired in sin and error and ugliness, they are. But the glory of one saint outshines all the misery in the world combined, it's true. So if we wanna know what God is really accomplishing, we can see what he's doing in those souls. We can see what he's bringing about in their mysticism and it's, even if they are vastly outnumbered by the sinners in the world. That's no impediment to God. But it's also true that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So God is responding, God's not, un he's not unaware of what's happening. You know, he's just as in charge today as he ever was. He he's always perfectly in charge. He's giving more grace now than ever before in history. Also precisely because of how much we need it, precisely because of how bad it is in the church and the world today. And for everyone who rejects a grace, God doesn't want that wasted. He's holding it out now for someone else to ask for it. So ask for all of those rejected graces and they will be made yours. These, anyway, these graces, operative throughout church history, we're reaching the culmination of them now. And I am gonna skip through more quickly here than I had anticipated, but I do wanna point out just how seriously the church fathers these are the first, the first era of sacred traditions development, the era of the fathers of the church. Their biggest teaching was divinization. Their, most, their greatest passion was that we be deified, that we be made like other Christs. There's a bunch of quotes here that you can, uh, you can see in my book if you, if you wanna look at them, but they're all, they're all basically boiled down to what's called the great exchange. God was made man, that man might be made God. And that's not literal, of course, we, we ourselves always remain creatures, but it's a process of our becoming godlike through the graces available to us in Christ. This was not one of their, this was not just one of a million opinions they had, and they had a lot of thoughts on things. Like you, scripture, patristic scholars today, you have to dedicate your whole scholarly career to one little tiny part the teachings of the fathers of the church to master it. Like, they, it's an enormous wealth of teachings they have. But their fundamental passion is divinization. It is deification. If we want to know what they really wanted for us, it was this. It was that we not merely be saved, not merely just get, get redeemed, get, 
get saved. You know, that's, that's, of course, the foundation, going from a state of mortal sin to a state of grace. That's called justification. By, by that process, we're redeemed, and yes, that's so important. You can't possibly overestimate the importance of that. But that's not the beginning of the spiritual, that's, sorry, that's not the end of the spiritual life, that's the beginning. You know, a lot of the evangelicals, they treat that as the end of the spiritual life. Okay, once I was blind, now I'm not. I'm good, I'm saved, just waiting. That's not the Catholic view. The Catholic view is that that's our beginning, the, the, that's the beginning of what the mystics of the Middle Ages would call the purg purgative way. It's we're just getting started then. So what we really want to be like is like God. St. Maximus the Confessor, he's a father of the church. I need, he's closer to the end of the age of the fathers. And he is, really has a quote here I can't skip over. And I'll first look at, yet again, Pope Benedict XVI's teaching on St. Ma I'm quoting Pope Benedict a lot, aren't I? It's, uh, I think God gave him a unique mission. And... I think a lot of it has to do with precisely this. And I don't think Benedict himself knew that or knows it, but his teachings are just incredible for the divine will. And I speculate, I don't think his mission's over. I think he's still got a lot of edification to give to the church. Anyway, here's, here's what Pope Benedict says about St. Maximus. St. Maximus tells us, and we know that this is true, that Adam, and we ourselves are Adam, Pope Benedict says, Adam thought that the no was the peak of freedom. But the height of freedom is in the yes, in conformity with God's will. It is only in the yes that man becomes himself, only in the great openness to the yes, in the unification of his will with the divine, that man becomes immensely open, becomes divine. It is in the yes that man becomes free. This is the drama of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. It is by transferring the human will to the divine will that the real person is born. This, in a brief few words, is the fundamental point of what St. Maximus wanted to say. And here we see that the whole human being is truly at issue. The entire question of our life lies here. This is Pope Benedict XVI teaching on St. Maximus, who himself is saying it is all about the unification of the human will with the divine, and that this is, quote, the entire question of our life. Sounds, starting to sound familiar, isn't it? Starting to, starting to see some recurring themes here. So if we want to fulfill the entire purpose of our life, we need look nowhere else than the transferring of the human will to the divine will. We keep coming back to Gethsemane. Why do we keep coming back to Gethsemane in these teachings? Because that's when it's hard to say, thy will be done, right? You know, it's, it's kind of easy to say, thy will be done when you're when you're having a delicious breakfast over at uh, J was JC's, is that where we went? It was just, I'm still thinking about the bacon. Um, that was just really good. And that, that's really easy to say that will be done sometimes. And that's, that's good. Don't feel guilty. Blessing God when things are going well. You know, we need to praise God at all times. Get, bless his will in all things. And he wills for us to enjoy ourselves and he also wills crosses. But we focus, of course, on the crosses here, not because we should forget about God other times. In fact, Jesus laments to Louisa that some people only have this virtue of, of abnegation to his will when things are going bad, ironically, because they forget to be cognizant of his will in other times in their life. But for most of us, the struggle will be in these crosses, and that's why Gethsemane is so essential. It's why we need to always remember that as our model. We, um, and these crosses, can be big or small. And if they're big, if it pertains to something that's already happened, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, I'm, I just, I'm gonna t end talk one in just a couple minutes, and I don't wanna end this without getting to this point. If it's something that happened, guess why it happened? Because it was God's will. There's no other reason for something to happen other than he's omnipotent, omnipotent. There's nothing he can't do, and he's purely good. So it doesn't matter why it seems like something happened. It doesn't matter how bad it seemed. It doesn't matter how bad it was, because God's not a power of positive thinking God. Like, he's aware that there are bad things, and he's honest about it. If it happened, it's because it was part of a perfect plan, and we have to trust that. In the hardest things, it was part of a perfect 
plan. He knows exactly what's best for all of us. And we are left with just a simple choice. Do we give our fiat to that? Do we say God's will be done or do we rebel against him? We have to always give our fiat. If we can do that in those times, we will receive the gift of living in the divine will. We will. The, um, the other things that we need to, we, this abnegation to the divine will, we also need to have it looking forward, move, looking at things ahead of us, that it's okay to pray for things to go a certain way, that's fine, I sure do, I got kids, we're praying, we, you know, always praying for dangers and sicknesses and all that stuff to be avoided, but always when you're saying prayers like that, you do wanna add a few words at the end of each such petition, don't you? Nevertheless, thy will not mine be done. Because it could be so much better for you. you know, even small things, don't, don't only think about this in the big trials. You're coming up in a green light, it's been green for a long time, oh please, please, let's stay green, please God, please, please God, let's stay green, but thy will be done. <laughs> and, then <it's, laughs> and then it turns red, and that's okay. Like, all the time we need to have this outlook on life. To sque at least squeeze one thy will be done in there at the end of those petitions. And God can work miracles through that. He, he will. Even if you get stuck at a couple red lights, it's worth it. It's worth it for, uh, for heaven. Um, and it's worth it for the gift of living in the divine will. So we will, let's, we're gonna trace out a little more the development of this. And I'm gonna have to wind up putting aside most of these notes to get through it all, and that's okay. I, you, you can see, there's, some, there's a lot of new stuff in here, but you can see uh, some of it in my books as well. Let me end our first talk here on that note. Always beseeching the will of God in all things great and small, good and bad, painful and comfortable, thy will be done. Make that the mantra of your life, make that the essence of all your passion and zeal, and you'll be all set, and soon the whole world will be all set. So let's take a bathroom break, and then maybe come here, and do you, you wanna come up here? or? Okay, so we'll be back here in like 10, 15 minutes to pick up a part two then. Okay, thank you. <laughs>